I gotcha. Howdy. <laughs> Finally got the freaking pop out chat. Because for some reason, Restream is being a bit of a jerk. Isn't that the way? Anywho, I will send in a message to them saying I need my chat. So how are you guys? What's going on? Good evening, afternoon, morning. Goodness. So today we are going to talk about sharks. Sharks, sharks, sharks. Um, so I messed up and I accidentally had this event up for last weekend, but Bull was out of town, but Bull is back. So yay. Happy, happy being back weekend, Bull. <laughs> so, Thank you, Mel. Uh, you're welcome. So it's Shark Week. It's absolutely Shark Week. Um, and so I figured we would talk all things to do with sharks. This is one of the topics suggested by a viewer. Next weekend is string theory. So that'll be fun. Get ready to have your mind blown over that as we get a, into a little bit of quantum too. So that'll be fun. Um, so I guess let's go ahead and get started talking about all things sharks. All right, so here we go. So today we're talking about sharks, everything to do with them, all of the stuff and things that we love. So this is essentially what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about what they are. What are they essentially? How are they different? How can you tell the difference between sharks? I mean, other than, you know, sometimes they, they kind of look very, very different. Even the species, there, there are big tails and you don't have to sit there and analyze the color of the spots or anything like that. So we'll talk about how to tell the difference between them. Um, we're going to talk about different issues associated with sharks. Um, there's this uncanny and strange fear that people have for sharks. We have a little bit of the media for that, but it's in the form of, of movies. But, you know, fair enough. Nobody wants to be eaten by a giant thing with huge teeth. That seems like a horrible way to go. And also, what can we do when it comes to sharks? What is it that we can do? All of the things, conservation is important. So these are things that we're going to discuss today. All right. So essentially the breakdown. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There are more than 400 species of shark. I'm certain there's other species, maybe teeny tiny little sharks that we are still, you know, hadn't found yet. We're finding new species of things all the time. Um, there is similar anatomy between sharks uh, and that kind of like separates them from all of the other types of animals in the ocean. Uh, they have an excellent sense of smell. They have good eyesight and great hearing. They can have different personality traits that are individual to the sharks. They behave in certain ways when they're in groups and they can also have their own particular um, personality traits that are individual to them. And there are some that are endangered and threatened largely due to um, the shark fin industry and cartilage industry. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Hello. Okay. So let me dive in a bit and, <clears throat> talk a, a bit about what we're going to do here. What What's going on? And I'll also catch up on the chat if anybody has questions. Okay. So since it is Shark Week, I feel it's important for us to touch on all of the things that sharks do. Sharks are friends, not food. Um, and it's important that we recognize this. Many of their species are increasingly becoming endangered because of the shark fin industry. In addition to this idea, this is not un this is not um, unlike the rhinoceros and their horns. Um, there's this idea that sharks can cure cancer because they don't get cancer. They can't cure cancer in people. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. For this talk, I have pulled loads of resources online. Um, NOAA, N-O-A-A, -A, um, you can check them out. World Wildlife Federation, Shark Insider, Sharks World as well, which is a conservation group, and more. Live Science, National Geographic, there's a load of information, loads of information about sharks on the internet. And you can also check out my sources at the end of this talk, as well as download all of these slides, all of these I make available to you, and learn even more on my website, scientistmail.com resources. 
every single talk I've ever given on my videos where I have had slides, you can download there. So if you're a teacher, if you're giving a talk or something like that, and you need, you need something from a particular topic, check out my website. All of this information is there for you to, to download. All right. Sharks do get cancer. I haven't, not from what I've read, Nather, but maybe there's something that you've seen that I haven't. Um, if, if they do, I was, I would think it was extremely rare um, to, cause they tend to not develop the capillaries that, uh, come up, you know, that would feed towards the tumors. And there've been some studies to where if they replace certain cartilage and other animals, then, um, the, the area surrounding the tumors do not get any capillaries to them. And that's essentially what, you know, cancer metastasis is. So perhaps they get tumors, they just don't become benign. So I could see that. That might be a thing. Also, they're very, um, they're disease resistant. And there are some um, compounds within sharks that can be, that are being studied for antiviral research. But that doesn't mean we should go killing sharks, eating their cartilage, thinking that this is going to help us somehow, because that's really not how it works. Pharmacokinetics is a thing, how a thing moves through the body. And just, you know, you're eating something, your body's going to break it down in your stomach. And there's no guarantee that those particular compounds that are useful to sharks would do anything in your stomach. We still need um, some research on that, particularly the antiviral stuff. But um, that's what I've seen thus far. All right, let's have a look at um, these different characters. And also, Nasser, if you have information um, to where more information about the sharks thing, please do post it in the comments and I'll pin it and direct people to other sources because, you know, I'm always learning too. So that'd be really awesome if you've got some stuff that I can kind of throw, throw in there too. That'd be great. So if you do have further information that I didn't particularly cover on this particular talk, please do post in the comments, hit me up on Twitter, and I'll make those particular resources available. Because just like me, just like science, I evolve and change and learn and grow. And we find out new things all the time in science as well. That's the thing, whether or not you change your perception based on new information. Get new information? Okay, awesome. All right, so let's talk about the different body characteristics. Sharks. Woohoo! They have a cartilage skeleton. They don't have bones. This makes it particularly difficult, especially when it comes to um, fossilization. <laughs> That's why it's mostly teeth. Uh, we mostly see teeth when we find shark fossils because the fact that that's what, you know, the calcified, you know, teethy bony things are. They don't really have bones in their skeleton. So, um, skin, their skin is covered with dermal denticles and it kind of feels like sandpaper when you run your hand across it. They have very powerful jaws. Um, and so they can, they can just crush right into you. They have an extremely efficient liver and they have an anatomic tail. They have dynamic fins and highly developed senses. So let's take a look at a shark's anatomy. Um, for this particular shark, we got a great white here. They have a lateral line. So there's a line that's along their body. Um, they have nostrils, the um, ampullae of Lorenzihi. I guess that's how you say it, ampullae, ampullae of Lorenzihi. That's their electro recognition centers. And we'll talk a bit about their sensory abilities here in a second. Um, they have various gills and slits. They have pectoral fins, pelvic fins, anal fins, caudal fins, dorsal fins, first and second. Um, these are all usually indicative of a shark. Uh, and we'll talk about how you can tell them apart here in a second. All right, shark sensory. Sense characteristics. What do they do? Well, they tend to have a lateral line of um, sensory, like along that lateral line we saw in the last picture, that little ampullae of Lorenzi, oh, Lorenzini. I say words wrong and I spell them wrong sometimes. Apologies for that. They do have a powerful sense of smell. They're able to detect blood in the water. 
um, that can hear. You've got the yummy hum, that particular humming sound that they say the where they're supposed to draw, um, draw sharks, uh, chum in the water. That allows them, you know, when, when you're trying to draw sharks in for study, you add blood to the water, you're going to get some sharks. Good way to do it. Um, they have good eyesight and great hearing. Let's take a look a little bit on how these particular electroreception works. All right, so along the ladder line, and this is from How Stuff Works. So if you've um, not checked it out, that's kind of cool. Uh, so they have like this ladder line, this main tube that goes along their body, and they have different surface pores. Now, if we're going to talk about their um, ampli, their little electro reception, that essentially is in their um, little nose area. This is um, electrically um, sensitive receptor cells that are kind of right in positioned under the skin in the shark's head. Now they are connected to these pores that are on the skin surface. So they're like small little jelly filled tubes. Now scientists are still trying to sort out a lot of these ampullary organs. But what they do know is that these sensors allow the sharks to see different weak electrical fields that are kind of generated by other living organisms. Um, the range of this electro sense can be a bit limited. It tends to be a few feet in front of the shark's nose, but this is enough to seek out all kinds of different fish and um, other prey that might be hiding on the ocean floor. Now this lateral line I was talking about that, that's another type of unique sense organ. Basically a whole bunch of these little tubes that we see, um, let me get my notes. <laughs> you guys don't realize this, but I do actually have notes that I go on that go through and help me. I do this in advance, but you know, hey, <laughs> I lose my notes sometimes. Okay, so these two main tubes run on both sides of the shark's body, which makes it really cool. It goes from the shark's head all the way down to its tail. The water flows into these main tubes through pores on the skin's surface. Now, the insides of these main tubes are kind of lined with these little hair-like protrusions, and they're connected to the various sensory cells. So when something comes near the shark, the water running through that particular lateral line on either side of the body moves back and forth. This then stimulates those sensory cells alerting the shark that there could be any potential prey or predators in the area. So that makes them really, really freaking cool. All right, let's talk a bit more about this and get into this and let me catch up on the chat. How do sharks communicate? That's a good question, Jens. I would imagine they might do it through um, through uh, body language. That could be one thing. Um, I'm not entirely certain, but they do have various personalities and behaviors when they are in different groups. So I imagine the behaviors are kind of like the key um, on how they can talk to each other. Um, Nether says, sharks are long lived, but their cells do mutate and as such they do get tumors they however don't get many of the more common cancer versions affecting vertebrates fair enough no boning sharks got it morton all right <laughs> and then the lorenzi zini the ampullae of lorenzi zini contain a protein that is also present in humans um of course sharks have met orders of magnitude more of it than humans do but the ones we do have still react to electrical fields yes so we are, um, we are capable of being receptive to electro electrical fields. I talk a bit about this in, when, I, when I did the science of ghosts and when we talked about um, what it is that people experience. We are um, susceptible to different types of electrical fields and it can even take us to the point of hallucination. You can get a rash, um, all of these different types of things can affect, and there's some people who are more sensitive to it than others. So good call, Nether, on that. So sharks have many similar characteristics, but how can you tell the difference between species? 
you look at their body signatures, the shape of the head, fin placement, tails, and the like. So let's take a look on how we tell the difference between them. All right. We got a we got a yes or no. We got little binary dyna, di, dinograms. I, I was going to say dinograms. It's diagrams, guys. Binary diagrams. Yes or no. All right. So if you're looking at the different types of species here, you want to know whether or not it's um, one species or another. First thing you can kind of do is the head with a lateral canard like expansion. So is there stuff coming off of their head like a hammerhead? If it's yes, then that's the species you got. So the next thing you do is look at the dorsal fins. Are they above or behind the pelvic fins? Remember the pelvic fins are lower. If they are behind the pelvic fins, then they're part of like the cat sharks family. If not, all right, precaudal pits. Are they present? Are they at the top of the edge of the caudal, fill, the caudal fin undulated? If yes, we're looking at whaler sharks or requiem. All right. If no, we've got hound sharks. Okay. So that's one way to go about it. The next set, if you're like, all right, I'm still not sure. Anal fins. Anal fins are a thing, guys. So if it doesn't have an anal fin but its body is flat and ray-like, then it's part of the angel shark family. But if it has an anal fin, and then it's got one dorsal fin, six to seven pairs of gill slits, then you're looking at cow sharks. Then you look at the dorsal fins with spines. Their dorsal fins have spines. Yes, bullhead sharks, fantastic. Is the mouth in front of the eyes? Yes. All right. We've got carpet sharks. No, we keep going. All right. Do they have, um, oh God, this is where nicotating. How do we say that? I can't nicotating. See, you can tell that I'm not a marine biologist because even I, I struggle with them. I think the word is nicotating. Nicotating. See, as much as I learn, I still don't know every word ever. Nictitating, a nictitating eyelid present. Is it present? Yes, you got ground sharks. If not, we're dealing with mackerels. Now, if all of that overwhelmed you and you're like, I just want to stick to the basics, man. I need to stick to the basics. I don't want to have to deal with nictitating eyelids. Not everybody does. I, I know I, I don't necessarily want to get up close enough to a shark and go, there are nictitating eyelids. That means it's a ground shark. Maybe you don't want to do that. So what do I do? I look at their their tails. All right. Take a look at their tails. So if it's a tiger shark, it kind of has that little scythe type of tail. If it's a poor beagle, it's going to have that shorter version of like the great white. Nurse sharks, more kind of straight thrasher. A look, kind of like the tiger shark, but it's a bit thinner. And then you got the cookie cutter shark kind of looks like part of a cookie um, on its tail. So if you're really worried and you don't want to have to sit there and write down all of the different types of fins, whether they're at anal or not, nictitating eyelids, then just look at the tails. That's one way to do it. So let me see. The chat's pretty quiet. Hey, Peter, what's up? I know we, we took a couple weekends off. So it's like, People are like, oh, wow, Mel's back on her Saturday morning science shows. We should probably go and watch. And happy Shark Week, guys. So um, let's see. Sharks have had minimal changes over the years, but have perfected the art of hunting and survival, being resistant to diseases and cancer. Now, we will get into the shark's cure for cancer myth in just a bit, but let's look at my favorite ancient shark, Megalodon. Oh, my God, the Megalodon is awesome. <laughs> oh, come on, what's the worst that can happen? Megalodon. Okay, so just so you know, that's not an actual picture. I know I don't need to tell you guys that, but I'm just saying somebody might pop in and be like, oh, my God, it's Jurassic Dinosaur. Well, no, this wouldn't be Jurassic. When Me Megalodon died out around 2.6 million years ago, 
which particular period I can't remember right off. It's probably around, was that around Triassic? Hmm. Anywho, here we've got our Megalodon. Now, as made popular by various films, including the Meg. Now, Megalodon was absolutely massive. Land sharks. <laughs> Only on Saturday Night Live. And they pretend to be dolphins that bring you candy. So, if anybody says candy, Graham, I'm just a dolphin, ma'am. Don't, an don't, don't answer the door. Because they're, they're probably a shark. So megalodons, they can they could get up to about 60 tons, um, you know, and, and they're pretty freaking scary looking. I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed the Meg. I just really did. I got to see it in IMAX and that, you know, and I know it's absolutely inaccurate and the science is utter crap, but it's just really fun to see giant sharks swimming around with people, you know. There's some appeal to that, but you know, hey, after a while, you're kind of like, eh, anywho. So, yes, if you have a megalodon in the water and, and you're in a boat, yeah, you, you've already lost. You've, you've lost that fight already. Let's take a look at how their sizes compare to, to modern sharks. All right. So the megalodon's maximum size is probably around 18 to 20 meters. Um, so 18 to 20 meters. One meter is about three feet. So that's about 60 feet then, isn't it? Um, hmm. It's about the size of a city bus. Yes. Yes, about the size of a city bus. Have I seen Sharknado? I have not. I've not. I think I tried to watch it, but I just couldn't. I, I have to. I have to be in a mind to where nothing bothers me at all with incorrect science in order to watch something like that. I, I don't. I don't do well with films like that because they just get on my nerves. <laughs> now, the maximum size is about 60 feet you know, probably closer to around 15 meters, which have been, uh, let's see, what's 15? That would be around 45 feet, I guess. And then we have the whale shark and great white. And there's you if you're in scuba gear. Um, so you, you, I guess you could have you swam right into the megalodon's mouth and hitched a ride, you know, for a little while. But... Um, I don't know that I would recommend doing that. That's probably not the best thing. So let's have a look at, at size of the teeth. So this tooth here comes to us from the Bertucci family. That is a, that's a megalodon tooth. That's pretty freaking huge. Um, <laughs> so I can imagine if you were to go into a fight with a megalodon, the best thing you can do is probably hop on the top of it and, and just ride it out until, until you get somewhere. I, I don't know. I, I can't imagine how that's going to go. But then they can go underwater so you might drown. I mean, there's just, I don't know how you could survive a megalodon attack. That I, have, I have absolutely no way. I mean, at least with like great whites and stuff, you know, you can, you can mess with their sensory point on their nose, you know. And then that puts them in like a trance-like state because you've like hyper, um, hyper overloaded their senses, you know, with that electro reception. That's why they're like, get them on the nose. And then they go into this trance-like state. Yes, you could do that. But I don't know. How would that, it's just, we're, we're so limited on a lot of what we know about Megalodon. Because, you know, fossils, they don't really have any because they're all cartilage except for their teeth. That's why we have like all this teeth. But oh my gosh, can you imagine having to try that technique with a freaking megalodon? I'm just going to push on its cute little nose, which is like the size of a house on it, like, like, the, like the size of a front of a house maybe. Golly. All right. <laughs> Oh, God. Let's have a look at some, some 10 amazing facts about the Megalodon. And here we have a picture from the Meg. Just push on its nose, Jason. Just push on his nose and make him go to sleep. 
<laughs> I think I would have liked to have seen that. To see Jason Statham. I'm going to push on his nose and put him in a trance. That wasn't even an option in the film. But boy, that would have been funny. Wouldn't that have been funny? Push on his nose until he, he goes into a trance. All right. So some facts. Hello, everyone. Here's some facts for you. The Megalodon was the largest predator ever in existence that we can deduce from the current information. Had about seven inch teeth on average. And it's not as closely related to the great white as we had thought in the past. Um, there, there were a lot of different, it goes back and forth still. That's the thing. When you're dealing with putting um, extinct creatures on the phylogenetic tree and determining how closely they're related to modern um, creatures. It always gets a bit hairy whenever you get new information. You sit there and go, okay, well, we got to rethink this. Now, it doesn't mean they're not related to the great white. It just means not as closely related as we thought. And that's the thing that happens with science. When you get new information, you kind of adjust where you put things. And that's okay. Whales were the breakfast of choice. So while some of you might be sitting here eating your cereal, I already, you know, I still have a plate of strawberries over here. I hadn't actually eaten them with strawberries yet. They preferred whales and they liked to eat whales. There's apparently a worldwide distribution of megalodon. They weren't indicative to any one particular area, but they're spread out. They had the most powerful bite out of all of the predators. There were, they have found lots of different nurseries, um, ancient nurseries. They're not current because megalodons are extinct, but there were a lot, they have found little pockets of um, nurseries where they had little baby megalodon teeth, little small ones that they've been able to find. So there apparently were little nurseries where baby megalodons grew. They had 276 teeth in five different rows. So if the first bite didn't get you, don't worry. That teeth, will, that tooth, if it, if it ends up in you, another one's just going to roll right down. Um, you know, that's that's what you do. So let me <laughs> let me catch up in the chat. <laughs> megalodon were still hunted. They have been there have been juvenile megalodon teeth found inside whale fossil stomachs. True. Yes, babies are always easy, easy prey. We all know you should flip a megalodon on its back. It'll go to sleep and you can swim away. Oh, yes, absolutely. Try flipping a bus on its back and let me know how that goes because that would be kind of was there. Morton Nielsen says, again, what's the worst that could happen? Just swim in there and it never noticed anyway. Yeah, I guess you could swim in a megalodon's mouth. It's kind of like, it's funny because... Um, I actually went oh, a long time ago. I went to the Underwater Explorer Society in the Bahamas out in Freeport. Fantastic organization. This was probably nine million years ago. And hopefully they're still around because they're absolutely wonderful and very educational. They offer scuba diving classes there to where you can get certified and go out on a dive and, and dive with sharks. I went to their dolphin habitat. Now, they don't actually keep dolphins there. But they do train dolphins, but dolphins are free to come and go as they want. They do tag them so they can keep up with them. But sometimes these dolphins bring friends back with them and then they all have fun. Now, one thing that was funny, there's this common misconception that dolphins will help people all the time. They can't, they, they're, they're kind of meh about all of it. Sometimes if, it, if, it, if, if they want to, they can help you. So if you got like a shipwreck or something, or you're floating around in the water, maybe you were left behind on like a, a really a mom pa type of um, scuba thing and they didn't do the head count right. And you're stuck out in the ocean and a dolphin comes along. Well, according to these particular people that work with dolphins, dolphins don't care one way or another. If they want to help you, they will, but they might just drag you back out further into the ocean and leave you there too just happens on whether or not you get a jerk dolphin or a dolphin that likes you, or maybe you're just a good diversion for sharks in the area. They'll drag you out there and leave you there. So, um, yeah, it's kind of funny how that goes. Uh, dolphins are not fish. No, they're not. Baby shark, shark, shark. I have never heard that song, and that makes me very happy. 
um, whales, breakfast of champions. Absolutely. Um, yes, I don't see any flaw in this plan. <laughs> I'm going to go for it. <laughs> uh, yes. All right. So Megalodon died out about 2.6 to 2.8 million years ago. They don't exist now. Although it's kind of fun to watch them in, in movies. You know, I was mentioning that before, watching the Meg in an IMAX film. is always a lot of fun. So something to think about, though. Sharks have gotten a bad rap ever since the film Jaws. Now, this is something that a, a lot of people don't understand. Jaws terrified the ever-loving crap out of most people, including myself, to the point sometimes I still get out um, when I'm in the ocean thinking about sharks because, you know, Jaws. Peter Benchley, the author of the book, shortly after the film came out, people started freaking out and started hunting sharks just to try to keep them out of the water because they're afraid they're going to get eaten just like Jaws. He started um, his own conservation efforts shortly after that once he learned more about sharks and he still, to a degree, regrets um, having portrayed them as such because of the fact that many t different species of sharks are becoming increasingly endangered. Um, but yeah, do check out some of Peter eventually stuff where he went, he's, he's actually kind of worked towards shark education now, which is kind of neat. Um, all right. So people are afraid to be eaten by giant things with teeth. Fair enough. That's kind of a creepy way to go and awful and terrible. And I can't imagine just nothing peaceful about that whatsoever and extremely disturbing, in my opinion. That's pretty awful. Yes. Now, shark hunting was a thing and it still is. However, the biggest issue is killing sharks for the cartilage and for shark fin soup. Shark conservation is exceedingly important in that they are apex predators. We need our predators to keep the balance of diversity and animal population in sync within these aquatic um, ecosystems. So it's kind of kind of funny um, that you know people are so afraid of these sharks. You're 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 more likely to get hurt like killed by a cow than than you are a shark um, and your chance of getting killed by a shark is extremely low. Now, when we're talking about shark hunting, there's this idea that sharks can cure cancer. They can't. There will never be a cure for cancer as it is highly individual. Um, you can only lower your risk for cancer and work towards better treatments. Now, people hunt sharks for their cartilage looking for mir miracle cures. People also sharks being called fins. This is a delicacy with no nutritional value or medicinal properties at all for humans. All right. Before we get into that, hey, Peter, yes, check out my shop. You can get some cool merchandise. You can get my cam girl for science stuff various colors available, t-shirts. Also, I have an entire section of my shop called my Blocked By series, where if there's a person or individual or group who exhibits poor behavior on social media, we take that poor behavior, put it on merchandise, and donate all the proceeds to various organizations for funding scientific research, civil rights, Organizations like the Trevor Project, Planned Parenthood, World Wildlife Foundation, um, American, um, the, the American Anxiety and Depression Association, because I'm a big advocate for people who suffer from mental health related illnesses. So for people who exhibit poor behavior on social media, I absolutely will take that poor behavior and turn it into something positive. I feel it's good. And Peter helps me out a lot with all that stuff. He makes commercials for it. So thank you so much. All right. Let's have a look when we're talking about shark fin soup. Let's take a look at this particular graphic. Um, so 
for this one, I have to blow it up on my mind because it's hard to see. All right, so 3% of a shark's body weight are considered the high value fins, while the rest of the shark has relatively little value and is often discarded. So there's 145 countries that engage in the shark fin industry. Now, the biggest fishers, the ones that are the, the, the biggest forerunners when it comes to shark fin soup, this is Indonesia, India, Spain, Taiwan, Argentina, Mexico, Pakistan, the United States, Japan, and Malaysia. Yes, the United States engages in sharpening. Um, it can't happen here. Oh, it does happen here. So take a look at this picture. This picture here are shark fins that are drying in the sun at the calcium, um, sun and calcium before processing. 30% of the world shark species are threatened or near threatened with extinction. This photo is by Sean Henricks for the Pew Environment Group. All right, um, let's dive in a bit more and talk uh, some more about shark fin soup. And I will happily take your questions and answer them to the best of my abilities. All right, so shark fin soup is only banned in 12 states within the US. Now, if you live in LA, you can have it home delivered for about $16.95 from a, a, local, um, a, a local Chinese restaurant. The thing that is particularly awful about shark finning is that they cut off the fins and throw the shark back in the water. It bleeds out and drowns to death. That's, that's how they go. They, don't, they tend to not use the rest of the shark, or if they do, they'll take some of the cartilage and put it in um, cartilage pills. There is no need to kill sharks for anything. They aren't magical creatures with nutrition that helps us. They don't cure cancer. They just live and exist and keep the ocean's populations and biodiversity balanced. Killing sharks is nothing but lower their population, threaten the diversity in the ocean, and make you look like a complete and total jerk for ordering shark fin soup or swallowing their cartilage pills. Don't be that person. Don't be that jerk that does that. Help through and donating to conservation groups. That's how you can help. Sharks are friends and not food. Let's do better and help our amazing ocean friends. All right, so let's take a look at a final message from our friend, the shark. And then we will have a chat a bit and I will answer your questions. So watch. Hey there. I just wanted to point out since summer is coming up that people are not the normal food of sharks. In fact, there were only six fatal shark attacks back in 2018, three of which were possibly scavenger type of situations. So keep in mind, humans aren't food. We don't wanna eat you. Be kind to us. Okay. <laughs> Humans are not the normal food for sharks, so be kind. And sharks don't want to eat you. They just really, really, really give you big mouth hugs. Sharks love mouth hugs. That's what that is. It's a, it's a mouth hug. Oh, my goodness. So let me catch up on the chat. It's weird because Restream is not picking up any of the YouTube chat, so... I'm sorry you don't see your comments on the stream, but I can see them in the side chat here um, on, on YouTube. All right, cows kill more people annually than sharks. Yes, this is true. Um, don't forget that deer are responsible for the most human deaths annually in the US. Yes, this is true. We can grow cartilage in vitro. There's no need to get it from animals, even if it did anything for the body. This is true, Nether. It's just wrong. We have cows to eat. Why the heck do we need to eat shark fin soup? We don't. There's no reason for us to have shark fin soup except to just look like entitled arrogant a-holes who don't quite understand the fact that an entire shark died just so you can have a little bit of their fin. And it died a horrible death. 
You think eating, getting eaten by a shark is bad? Try having your arms and legs cut off and then thrown into the ocean. That, that's kind of similar, isn't it? It's kind of similar. You bleed out and you drown. It's not fun either. And so that's that's what they do in shark finning. So there's absolutely no reason whatsoever to kill a shark for anything unless it's a rogue shark trying to eat people. And that's exceedingly rare. And even then, if that's your excuse, man, that's just like kind of. It's rare. Like. Really, really, really rare. I mean, you know, come on. What's the point? But there you go. All right. So um, a little bit before we wrap up, <laughs> can we go back to the, the chat really quickly? Go back to the chat really quickly. All right. So let me do a little bit of housekeeping really quickly before we wrap up. Um, so Sunday. Sunday is Oral Dacity, and Doc Savage will be back with us. We were off last weekend, uh, but we are back this weekend. Guess who's on the show? Guess who's on the show? We have Doc on the show again, as usual. And we also have Aaron Ra. Aaron Ra is going to be on the show, and it's going to be an absolutely fun show. And it's Sunday at 3 p.m. Central Time. So please do check it out. It's um, a, it's a comedy type of show. Um, it's a comedy type of show. And so um, Aaron will be on. I've already told him kind of the format. And so he's excited. He's like he's down for it. And so we're going to just talk about all the things that bug him, you know. And then we'll bring up, if you if you missed it, back in December, the 12-hour um, the live stream I had for Bull. You remember? And I called Kent Hovind. That was fun. We've got that video. We got a section of that video. We're going to have Arn watch and he can pick apart the arguments that Kent gave me. Because really, that was just a fact finding call. I just was completely like, what the heck in heck is this? And then, you know, I got to talk to him myself. So we're going to show um, a bit of that on Sunday. Um, and then we have our challenges. We have our is it real challenges. And we've got um, stupid things people say on the internet. So we might have a little bit of meow meow, my latest, my, my latest back and forth with Stephen Molyneux. I think that's his name. I couldn't pronounce his last name. So I just called him meow meow. So we have that. We're going to talk a bit about that. Um, and his bravely running away from my challenge. <laughs> From he bravely ran away, bravely, bravely. You know, maybe we'll sing that song for him. Um, and also, also, we do have um, a, a present for Aaron for Sunday, a video that Peter made that we're going to premiere on Oral Dacity Sunday at 3 p.m. just for Aaron Raw for lots of giggles and lots of fun. But that's what we're going to do. So we're going to have that little present for him. And then um, Peter will we'll put it on his Twitter. And you can check it out there too in, on his on his um, channel. All right. Really quick question. Um, probably a stupid question. But do we have freshwater sharks? Yes, we do. We do have freshwater sharks. Um, there is one species of shark called the bull shark um, that can be both fresh and saltwater. It's way more aggressive than a great white. And um, back in the early 1900s, there was um, a series of deaths associated with a shark that they thought was a great white, but it was mostly freshwater. Probably was a bull shark. So you can check that out. And um, I believe that's what Jaws, the book and film, was based on those particular um, attacks. Oh, sharks should not be... Um, Sharks should not be food at all anywhere. Aaron will talk to you again after tomorrow. <laughs> I think he'll be funny. So, yes. So, do check out Oral Dacity on Sunday. Aaron Ra will be there. Um, we, we got a lot of fun stuff planned. A lot of, a lot of funny stuff. Um, I know Doc Savage is going to fangirl. Because he fangirled a lot over PZ, which I thought was 
absolutely adorable. He was so cute when he was like fangirl and over that. So also he will he will probably fangirl over Arnroll. He's he's a big fan. So let's let's see if Doc can keep his um, composure. Yeah. So Doc Savage can keep his composure during during the Arnroll talk, which is it's gonna be fun. I can't wait. So do check it out. So let's wrap up what we're talking about here. Thank you guys for being here. All right, this is what we talked about. Sharks, what are they? How you can tell the difference between them? What are issues associated with sharks and what we can do to help them? All right, and then the essential breakdown. More than 400 species of shark. They have a lot of similar anatomy, but the differences are how you can tell the difference between them on their fins, their tails, the shapes of their heads, that sort of thing. They can have a sense of smell. They have an excellent sense of smell, fantastic eyesight and hearing, and they have electroreception. How cool is that? Electroreception. Um, they can have different personality traits, both how they act in a group and individually, and some are endangered or th and threatened because of shark finning and cartilage collection. We should stop hunting. We should stop hunting sharks all together. All right. So let's take a look. I think my sources are here. Now, I know you can't see all of this, but that's okay. I will post all of these on my website, scientistmail.com slash resources. Just click on the topic um, associated with the talk. And you too can download all the slides. Go check out my sources. And if I say something wrong, guess what? Let me know. I will own my wrongness. Thank you, Peter, for posting the link in the side chat for the oral audacity. Um, click on it, set a reminder. All right. So where can you find me on the interwebs? Oh, there you go. This is where you can find me. Um, YouTube.com slash scientistmel, scientistmel.com. We've got them on Periscope, Facebook, Twitch. And if you like what I do, I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash scientistmel. And I update um, every couple of weeks, I'll update a new audio version of a really cool episode of one of my shows. Um, I think the last one was on anti-vaxxers, it might be. Um, but they get their own RSS feed. They also get their own little perks. And every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., I have a private hangout with just my patrons to where we have a video chat and we just sit there and have a chat, get to know each other. And they see some of the behind the scenes work that I do for the show Oral Dacity. And so that's usually about the time that I'm like getting stuff together. So if you can spare a dollar a month, that helps me out. I'm often in the hole every month from what I do, but I don't do this to um, be rich, but it would be nice if this was my only job because then that would mean I could make more content. But they've helped me upgrade a lot of my equipment. So thank you to my patrons for that. And they get shout outs and the little commercial videos that I have before and after my show. So this has been the science of sharks. Thank you so much for being here. And if you have topics that you'd like me to cover on the show, hit me up in the comments, message me on Twitter. DMs are probably the best way to get me. Or you can use my hashtag, HeyScientistMel, so I can find your content, your topics, and your comments really, really quickly. And, you know, like, share, and subscribe. If you can't help me monetarily, get the news out. Get the good news of science out and just share what we do here. So, and bull, I pay bull. He, he gets paid. So patron money, if you're a patron of mine, you're a patron of bulls because I pay him for the work that he does here. So it's awesome. And it, it takes a lot of the strain off of my, me and my system in order to get that done. So thank you guys for being here. Any final thoughts, bull? <laughs> Oh, no final thoughts other than you're going to be on the Geek Room tomorrow too, aren't you? I'm on the Geek Room tomorrow? That's what Frankie was telling me. I'm on the Geek Room tomorrow. Am I? Okay. I forget. I must have I must have missed something. Frankie, hit me up in a message or something. If I'm on the Geek Room tomorrow. Um Ah, 
Mind if we show my fundraiser a bit? Not at all. So Dark, Doc Fearsome also, yes. So in or Oral Audacity, I will be wearing pigtails because somebody donated $200 to Doc Fearsome's car fund. Doc is a big supporter of mine and has been for a while. And so if you can spare a couple bucks, two or three dollars, um, you know, throw some dollars his way. Uh, I think I can put the, I'll put a, a link to his fundraiser on the oral um, description. So you can go through um, and, and have a, have a look um, and, and throw a couple bucks his way. So I will be in pigtails on Sunday because that was, that was a stipulation for somebody to, they donated at least a hundred dollars. Somebody donated two. So I will be in pigtails, guys. You don't want to miss that. You totally don't want to miss that because I have a lot of hair, you know. So I did that for them. So I will put a link to Doc's um, fundraiser in the oral dis oral audacity um, um, description for tomorrow. So please, please, please be certain to. And I do try to help out other people, particularly those who support my work. So thank you for that. And. Um, I think the geek room said it was a different person, Bull. <laughs> My mistake. Okay, and there that's okay. There is also a link to Doc's um fundraiser on his YouTube channel as well. So do check it out. All right. I know Bull, you gotta run. You gotta prepare for the geek room. You hop you got a busy day today, friend. So if you have any questions, you know how to find me. I'm literally everywhere. Just Google scientist smell and I'm certain something will pop up and you can find it. So thank you for being here. You always make each day special for me. You know how by just your being you. Thanks for sciencing with me, guys. Sending squishy science hugs. Bye.